it won't fly for acid. Is a crypto to stable coin trade classified as Litecoin? So, under if, if you're making that transaction as of today, no, absolutely not. Um, but for last year and previous year's purposes, that's a very edge case. Um, that's something that will come up in very rare cases, and I personally don't think um, it would. But the argument can be made that it is because it's just the same thing with a modification. Now there has been some guidance and some some uh, revenue rulings that have been issued by the IRS that pertain to other types of exchanges that could be inferred to um, apply here. And someone like me or you who's um, you know, somewhat familiar with the technology could sit down and write down an argument that would um, that would you know that might hold some water. Uh, what the IRS had said is if you take a piece of property and you exchange it for another piece of property, and in that sense you're just altering, modifying it so that its function is inherently the same, but there's some different modifications in, that change it in nature, that won't be taxed as a gain. And what they were talking about is debt instruments, right? If I'm you know, loaning money out to a company, I get a note. And if at some point I say, okay, I'm gonna swap this note for another note, but the difference between note A and note B is a few clauses and a few terms. Maybe the interest payment's a little bit different. Maybe the, the length of the note is a little bit different. Maybe what I get back might be a little bit different. That won't be, the, the, that difference in value between note A and note B won't be taxable to me as gain. Um, so you can say that that sort of machination or that sort of adjustment is what exists between different coins. Um, no one, no one has really tried, at least, at least to my knowledge, no one has really tried to argue this. It hasn't come up. Right now it would be an edge case. But, and again, this is not legal advice. I don't want to give you that mm -hmm. yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So I would say though, that's something interesting is, and, and you posted a great question about it, um, which as the uses and um, abundancy of crypto continues and grows, the government regulators are in an interesting position of having to, in, their hands are, are somewhat tied in terms of development. And I think we've seen that with a number of just like with tech boom and tech companies um, and some data privacy stuff, but there's, uh, what's interesting is like with the stable coins and with those transactions and in the one that, that um, I, I can't, personally describe it, but if you guys go to the Madison meetup, um, first posted a great comment about it where he liked it as read it. Yeah. And, and I mean, you can feel free to jump in and explain it, but um, it, it's a fairly simple technical transaction that looks like eight or nine taxable events. Yeah. And the other, I don't speak to the IRS, but it would be my opinion that they don't want to be seen as, as an impediment. And um, I, they would like to, to get taxable, to tax taxable income, but they don't want to stop um, they don't want to halt a growing economy necessarily that in which it's become very easy for people for a lot of good reasons um, to, to trade a variety of these assets now very quickly easily and because people are going to do it anyway people have been doing it and so um, when we talk about it right now i would say that sec um, cftc irs they're they're knowledgeable um, but and they released a lot of the irs has released as much information but you, you kept track of what SEC has released, um, CFTC, and the, the Government Accountability Organization as well, There's, you can tell that they're watching this space. And, they, and similar to a lot of us, they aren't sure exactly where it's going to go and, and how they should be involved as players. Um, and so a lot of the work that's been done has been criminal prosecutions, avoiding um, different scams and frauds, and saying, well, yeah, this is very exciting, but we want to protect the consumer. Um, and the IRS is also saying, and we would like to make sure that people aren't making all like bandits here um, with what we define it as taxable. From, from a theoretical standpoint, from, from at least from a legal standpoint, if this sort of like kind of exchange gets denied, um, what you're doing is essentially trading property for another property, similar to what we covered previously about um, you know using Bitcoin or using some sort of cryptocurrency to buy a tangible asset. Um, Here's 0 0.000001 Bitcoin for a pair of sandals, right? You know, that might be taxable as a gain or loss to you, depending mm -hmm. on what 
your basis was in that Bitcoin initially. Um, so if it's not a like-kind transaction, then you have to look at each taxable event that happens over your trades between coins and say, okay, what was my basis in my first coin? What was my basis at the time I swapped it for another coin? And then later on, just kind of chain it along, if that makes sense. And then uh, another thing I want to bring up quickly is, um, well, here, yeah, yeah, quick question. If you did a, uh, a light kind of change to 1031, how would that look on your, I've heard that you still have to report each trade, per se? Yeah, Charlie, um, how would that look like? So or, I think or, that one I'm going to check. I've also heard that some people just do like a summary, an overall summary, and that some kind of fly. I've heard one CPA say that, but. Yeah, Charlie can chime in and say what the, I, he would know best as to how uh, that uh, works mechanically. Uh, yeah, and so we'll handle it. What, what I want to say quickly on that discussion, though, and just in the general view of uh, here's this bustling economy which it, it is not going to stop growing um, in, in an ecosystem. And so this phrase was important, that's why I left it in here, this second sentence. In some environments, it operates like a real currency, but it does not have legal tender status in any jurisdiction. So legal tender means that. You are, any transactor is obligated to receive it for debts. Um, so, what about the US dollar is, so Tether is an interesting debate. You guys are probably familiar with Tether and some of the, um, the, the fun behind it. But the fact that, um, ten, so it's, oh, well, maybe Tether's not backed by anything. And the, and the US dollar is backed purely by the US economy and, and how large it is and how well it operates. And a long term interesting thing to see will be, and the US dollar is the only form of legal tender. Um, but an interesting thing that we'll need to see, if on that timeline I filled out kind of other government entities and what they said about it, um, the Federal Reserve, for years, has kept track of virtual currencies, and uh, had interesting language in the context of the legal tender debate, which is, uh, this is two years ago, I think, uh, yes, we're aware of Bitcoin, and it is, this is like a throwaway line in, in some of their notes, it is currently not a threat to the U.S. dollar. And whether it is a threat to the U.S. dollar makes it super relevant because um, in the mid-2000s, there was a uh, prosecution of somebody who had been printing off uh, Liberty Dollar, I think it was called, where he said, I'm going to make my own dollar. And there's a number of jurisdictions in the country, um, there's one on the East Coast, I think, in Vermont, where they, it's, they have their own form of dollar, and it's kind of like a cutesy thing. But that's not a threat. But Liberty Dollar, the guy came out and said, I am a threat, I want this to be replaced the US dollar, it's gonna have my face on our government. Um, and it was a huge problem for him and he got he went to jail. And so the an interesting thing is I don't know if it's Bitcoin or what you know, maybe there's some crypto that will become the ubiquitous universal transaction. And maybe you don't think that's the case, I think that kind of is your philosophy of the crypto environment. Um, but in the event that it does, I believe that's the kind of discussions that regulators will be having of do we, is it a threat to the U.S. economy and therefore a threat to the U.S.? And can we look at it under these guidelines of, um, of its threat and, and, and how can we then regulate it? And that becomes a more negative discussion. And then, so yeah, we'll give it back to Chuck. So Chuck, like kind of exchanges and the specific question of how does that look on my, um, when I'm filling out my tax return? I've heard that I can, um, can do summaries. Do I have to do each one individually? And so over to you. Yeah, so good question. So let me preface it with an opportunity to on exchange yet. Now I'm just sort of waiting to see what the IRS is going to do. Um, I do think that it's not a regulate or um, I guess I think it's a reasonable election um, in certain cases. A lot of cop are willing to take, for example, a Bitcoin to Litecoin like kind of exchange, but a Bitcoin to a random utility token, uh, not much. So it, get, it really gets into the specific asset classes within cryptocurrency, um, which uh, I get a little bit response to the approach. Now, as far as taking a like kind of election, I have actually heard of a few accountants, one sort of like particular trade and essentially carrying the basis over to the newly purchased one of the game. Heard of uh, an accounting firm making a blanket election and attaching a summary um, 
to be honest, I've never made an election. I'm, I'm happy to start some research to you guys. Um, but I have heard sort of both scenarios. And I do want to touch on one thing. Um, what if the IRS denies my claim? In the event that the IRS, in three years, you make a lifetime election in three years, they deny the claim. Basically, what would happen is subject to additional and interest. And depending on your gain, that could be pretty significant. If you have a million dollar gain, you would the interest and what is uh, tolerant and how much money you made. I mean, I, I think the reasonable approach is going to at least do it correctly and do your due diligence. So you have a question? Yeah. And back to the case of uh, uh, Coinbase versus IRS. Do you know where the data resides? Is the data in a different country? Does it matter? If the data resides in a different country, that means the asset is in a foreign country? The user data or the or the the, the data that would represent the asset that's taxable? Well, the database of the company. Yeah, so if, um, I, well, it should, it should, I think this, this case applies to US-based stuff, but um, as a more general term, uh, the idea is that it doesn't really matter as a company if you're U.S. based where you store your data. Like I could, I could have my company here, but you know, data in India is it's a lot cheaper to store data in India or data in Europe somewhere than it is to store it, say, in Wisconsin, right? So I, my company adheres to the laws of the United States, and regardless of where that data is, it's subject to. No, I, I brought the issue this morning. Uh, NPR had a program about that precisely with the vice president of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. that for our legal purposes, the, the US is asking Microsoft to release data from their database, and they are replying saying, those databases are in a different country. You cannot do that. Yeah. So, so, so is, is, is the, the legality of asking or summoning data that is not in the country, I, I mean, I'm getting into a different topic, but, but in the end, it, it, it is related. Because I still have the question, if, if they decide that this is not a stock or a, or, or, or a currency, uh, and it's, an, it's basically a property, meaning an asset, yeah. asset needs to be decided in some way. So if I buy a house in South America, it's there, right? Yeah. So that's one question. The, the, the legality to, to uh, enforce retrieving data that is not really in the country, which is a, a Different legal question. Yeah, so that's that's a different legal question. And to the to the first question, the, the question of the asset. I think that something something with some with something as volatile as this. I mean, we can only wait and see. We can throw it out, throw out ideas as much as we want, and until someone actually goes to court over it, until someone actually sues somebody, until somebody's audited, uh, we won't actually get a solid idea of where the courts are heading with that. And, and I'm not familiar with the Microsoft case in particular or the intricacies of um, the ability for them to request production of data in different countries, but I would say it is likely not a, uh, a first-time issue. And maybe this, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, but what is unique would be, with, as we all know, the distributed nature of blockchains is that that data is now brought, is in all sorts of jurisdictions. And that kind of goes to some things about um, Internet law and some of the personal jurisdiction issues, so things that a court needs to establish to be able to um, adjudicate claims between parties include personal jurisdiction, which is um, does the party have minimal contacts with their jurisdiction? And I think there will be interesting questions that arise given that these ledgers are distributed. Yeah. Um, One uh, argument that can be made is that somebody who purchases a crypto asset. Know, they reside in the United States. That particular bit of data resides <coughs> across the ocean in some country somewhere. But their whole intent and purpose is to eventually cash out, you know, for dollars, buy something if, if the price really goes high. Um, again, that's all speculative on, on that nature. But as the, as time proceeds, as that particular case might proceed, um, a court or can get a handle on that person's contact. So even if their asset is lying in a, on a server in Brazil somewhere, on a server in India, 
Um, if they want to eventually take that and buy a house in the U.S., that would be enough to say, yes, we have jurisdiction, you're under the laws of the United States, in my personal opinion, based on how prior cases have gone in civil procedure and things completely unrelated to criminal currency. And I, I would say on the other end, don't assume that because it's distributed, courts will always have jurisdiction. Um, I've seen comments when people are speculating on Tether and who should do something about it and whether it's real and whether it's back. Uh, I saw a comment that was like, well, as long as one person in the U.S. purchases a Tether, then boom, there's jurisdiction. And that's not necessarily the case because um, there's other tests that have to meet and, and the context um, may have to be substantial. And so that gets into, into some other questions, but um, that's another one where it's courts are going to have to deal with complicated transactions between parties that are defining the traditional norms of how parties were transacting. Um, to the extent that the, the distributed ledger technology is different than electronic exchange of, of um, currency information, I think that's uh, a little outside the scope of today, but um, would, could also be up for today. For debate. Yeah, all I'll say about that is um, that has yet to be officially defined in our legal culture or our legal uh, terminology. Chuck, can we get on like kind of exchanges? <laughs>